Hi, everyone. Welcome to Champion Within Conversations, the platform where I highlight champions from all walks of life, people who have lived, overcome, and are walking towards being their best self. I'm very excited to have my brother on here today, Omar. I don't have any biological brothers, but I consider him a brother. We've known each other for a very long time, from an ancient time called 1999. We met when we were in seventh grade, and we've been friends ever since. Omar was at one time married, 14 years, presently divorced, and he has been through a lot of different things. I've seen a lot of those things. And it led him to eventually a path to self-discovery and rediscovery. And now he is a COO of a men's mental health organization that specializes in assisting men who have gone through traumas in that process of self-discovery and rediscovery. So that's a really awesome thing. So without further ado, here he is, Omar. How's it going, everybody? Mark, thank you so much for uh, having me on. I appreciate it. I forgot a part of my introduction. There's one thing I forgot to say. The really tall black guy that made all the ladies' heads turn. Do you know what that is? <laughs> I, I'm looking for him. <laughs> I don't know how well uh, you can see is. this. But uh, that's what you put for your remembered for section in the eighth grade yearbook. <laughs> the goal was to get a master's degree in money management and be the most successful man in my family. Remembered for the really tall black guy that made all the ladies heads turn. Uh, annoyance when a girl looks at you but is too shy to say anything and dream to be happily married with two kids, a house and a sports car. Now, what 14 year old do you know that says all this kind of stuff? So I just had to make sure I don't forget to put that in there. I remember you actually being that tall black guy that walked into this school where we were a very small part of the demographics, let alone a tall black dude from New York that was arrogant as ever, just walking around, giving everyone these looks. <laughs> but yeah, continue, man. Oh man, that that brings back so many so many memories. <laughs> um, it, it was a hard transition. It, it was you know New York life is really fast paced. I grew up in Queens, um, and at that time I had just just moved to Long Island, um, which was actually a cultural shock for me moving from Jamaica Queens, that's a predominantly black area, to you know in the middle of what seemed like nowhere upper middle class Long Island, predominantly white, and you're the only black kid in your class. Uh, that posed challenges before I even had moved up to Canada. Um, you know, for my parents, I was a troublesome kid. So going to school in Canada, I had lots of family that had gone to that school in the past. And it, it was almost like, I hope this school straightens him out and he finds some kind of reform to pull stuff together. And, uh, for me, being in a rural area where everything is kind of small townish, the school was on a pretty significantly sized campus, but it's just cornfields and soy fields around you, nothing going on. Um, that that was pretty uh, intimidating, to be honest. And I think that my personality just coming out and me being that New York kid was what I was holding on to in that transition. So it sounds like you were kind of using that to own the moment instead of just coming in here and showing people that it's just awkward and uncomfortable. I'm just going to take my New York swag and just be who I was when I was in these areas in Jamaica, Queens, et cetera. Absolutely. So I wanted to get into something that you and I have talked about a lot. Um, it's a cultural thing between you know, African-American families. And I wanted to know in your family growing up, the male leadership, whether that be uncles, father, grandfather, whoever, I wanted to know what was it like? What were the dynamics like when it came to receiving love from those individuals and their demonstration of what love is? 
That's a really good question. So in my family specifically, I grew up around my mom's family um, the most. My my dad wasn't in my life growing up at all, my biological father. Um, later on, my stepfather came into my life when, when I was very young, about six, seven years old. Uh, so male influences for me were pretty varied in, in a family dynamic, uh, but it was very stereotypical and traditional of Caribbean families where you would see this like machoistic, egotistical, tough guy mentality. Men didn't really show um, their, their emotions too much. Um, the only emotions you would see are more of what you would expect in terms of like frustration um, or anger, or you would see, you know, things of that nature, more and more assertive or aggression. Um, but in terms of being like tender or soft or much more understanding, you know, the men always ruled with more of a firm grasp on things, you know, and I think in many ways, looking back now through my current lens, uh, that's hard. You know, it's really, really hard because you could see the effects that that might have in, in some negative ways. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of positive uh, attributes, I think, came from that kind of firmness, that kind of assertion uh, that I think that being uh, a male specifically uh, was very useful and helpful as tools as I was growing up and as I've gotten older now. So I, I definitely believe in having the balance, but my family definitely, you know, the the men, like seeing men cry wasn't, it was rare, but it did happen. You know, especially some of my uncles, I think definitely had a much better balance of, you know, that, that kind of tenderness and softness and vulnerability. Uh, you could see that and it was visible, but it didn't happen often, it happened in moments and it was very, very short lived. And then you have the typical laughing and joking and kind of, you know, putting it off and not really addressing it or, you know, uh, being made fun of or poked fun at for crying, which, you know, we see a lot of with men that you're not really allowed to express your emotions that much. Yeah, thanks for that. So I wanted to jump into a video that I had sent you of an interview that took place between Shannon Sharp and DeMar DeRozan. For those who don't know who those people are, Shannon Sharp is a former football player. He's now retired and he hosts a few shows and DeMar DeRozan is an NBA player. So they were having this discussion centered around mental health. And then we got to a part of the discussion where DeMar DeRozan was telling him, Growing up, my dad was an old school man's man who was like, you better not cry. You better not show any emotions. And Shannon Sharp was relating to him and saying that his grandfather raised him like that. Men don't cry. Men don't show emotions. Emotions are a sign of weakness. And he actually said, I can't recall hearing my grandpa tell my grandma that he loves her. And then this is the statement I really want to get into. He said, he didn't tell us either, the grandkids. He said, you got a roof over your head? You got food on the table? Then I love you then. I don't got to tell you that. You're eating, right? So that was the statement, and that was the clip. So I wanted to ask you, because you are both, you've had your experience as a son growing up in what you described as a similar type of environment with the men. And now you are a father to two sons. What do you think of that statement? And what do you think that it means to show your love to your child? And how do you define that? I know that's a really loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. A uh, good series of questioning, though. Um, I think you need an understanding of, of love, you know, what, what that means. Um, I think people define find it differently. And I know we've had conversations about this in the past. Uh, you could see people where love as was given in that example is by what you see me do in terms of provision. Uh, there's no need to express how I feel or talk about the emotions of it. You should just have an understanding that because I'm doing these things, obviously I love you. And I think that while that satisfies some very generic baseline items, love goes much deeper than that. And I think that there are way more layers to love than that. There are way more ways of expressing it. Um, and I think that it, it could be very confusing for a child, 
you know, to question whether or not their parent actually loves them. You, you see actionable items, you're seeing the care, the food on the table, you see the house, but you also kind of understand like everybody else has that. You know, my friends have that, my family has that, but my dad doesn't tell me he loves me, you know, or my uncles, I, I don't hear this in the household, it's not normal, it's never expressed. So my friends have the same things that I have, but their dad says that he loves them and is very, you know, specific and clear about the way in which he loves them. And you could see the affection, the care, even the physical touch of hugs, forehead kisses, things like that. Um, and it, it will, I think, play on the psyche of a child and make them question, are they actually loved? Because what they see in their home with mom and dad versus the examples around them could be completely different, you know, as far across the spectrum as you can imagine. Um, for, for my own sons, you know, in terms of learning lessons from this, in, in my own experiences, I've had to evolve my definition of how I view love, you know, how I was raised, uh, how I saw people around me raised. And as I started to get older and become a man and step into the footing of what that means to me and look at having boys being raised and looking at the, the effects of, you know, my perception of love as a child versus my perception of love as a young man versus as a grown man, these have been completely different, you know, transitionary phases for me. So I think now being a father, love for me means so much more. I've learned that the way I could express love and verbalize love and affirm love to my children has shifted dynamically. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good, valid point that you make there. And I think it's a generational thing. The generations before us, they did have that same definition of love. Love is I'm here. You know, I'm here with your mother. I take care of bills. I make sure you're eating. I make sure that there's clothes on your back, food on the table, all that kind of stuff. And all that stuff is absolutely a part of love. But a lot of times these men, when they're not actually verbally hearing those words, even if all of those things are meant as a demonstration of love, they don't feel that. And I think that that can definitely have impacts on men uh, as they get closer to adulthood. So I know that you have Couldn't told me more. that, I know that you have told me that in your case, you decided to do the opposite with your children. So can you explain a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So for, for my boys coming to the realization that I had longed for, you know, a certain level of affection, you know, when, when you feel your heart wishes in moments, like I wish my mom and dad hugged me more, you know, I wish mom and dad told me, like could look me in the face and say, I love you so much. Like I really appreciate the impact that you have in my life. I'm so happy with you and your accomplishments. You're such a sweet child. Like affirming how you actually feel is such a emotional builder in a child. It, it really stacks up the bricks that lay the foundation of who that child is and the way in which they interact with their emotions in their environment as they get older. And for me, I had to make a, a transition with my kids. I'm very, very emotionally transparent you know, with my boys, um, talking about feelings and emotions and, you know, what they're going through and helping them process through difficult, challenging situations in their world um, is super important to me. It's something where you have to understand that they're learning and growing and learning how to express themselves. And sometimes they might feel emotions in a very raw way, you know, not have scope of how to handle and process that. And the biggest thing for me is it takes a lot of patience. To, to hear them out and let them verbalize and, and learning to be a listener, you know, and then providing them with positive feedback and solutions and tools to be able to navigate their world emotionally. And for me, it's constantly affirming how I feel when I see my kids, you know, sometimes I see them and I'm really proud of them. Like, I'm just thinking of the pride that I have for them in that moment. It's not to say that they did something in that moment, but because I'm feeling it, I verbalize it. I tell them like, Hey guys, just want to make a point. Like I'm super proud of you 
for the young men that you're becoming. I'm super proud of the fact that in this moment, you were able to process your emotions, take them in, think about them, turn them around a little bit, and then formulate either clarifying questions or formulate a response about how you felt without, you know, just being like emotionally vomiting or getting really upset or frustrated, you know, and then you start to see as a parent, as a father, the the tools and the bricks that you were laying to create this foundation, how it's really holding them, you know, and how it's giving them the ability to navigate their world much more effectively. I love what you just said right there about the positive affirmations that you give them. I'm proud of you. I love you. So in my family, <laughs> I think this is probably similar to what you were saying earlier. I was, mm-hmm. I always knew when I was doing something wrong, the love would get shown with the yelling, the belt, you know, whatever, whatever they needed to do just to let me know doing this is wrong. Now in their right. mind, I'm preparing you to get out in the real world. I want you to be like a respectable gentleman. I don't want you to lie. I don't want you to get into things that you shouldn't be getting into. Whatever I was doing in the household, like that anger response that they were giving in their mind was a teaching tool. So I heard secondhand many times about the men in my family, the older men, the uncles, dad, grandfather being proud of me but I heard of those things through my mom or through an aunt or through my grandma oh yeah your dad's really proud of you you know when we were talking he said that you did this and this and he was so happy with that and I believe that that was true but they didn't tell me those things firsthand so it didn't really resonate with me I'm like man I'm a screw up because the only thing that I get is these anger responses. I'm not seeing getting hit by with the belt as love. I'm not seeing these long Mm -hmm. lectures as love. And it's something that happens in households to me and it happens at work. We're trying to get production out of you. So we're gonna constantly tell you, you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. And that's gonna make you more productive or that's the motto. And I'm kind of translating that in my head to the family model where they feel like if I beat you up enough on the things that you do wrong, now you're going to do right. And I think that the way how you're talking about flipping that script and using those positive affirmations, telling them when they're doing well, telling them that you're proud of them and the things that they're doing that you think need recognition is going to make them do these things in a positive mind frame, which changes the game. Big time. Completely agree with that. And, and it's learning to set boundaries. You know, I think we grew up in a generation um, with parents that uh, were not born and raised here. Mm-hmm. So their view of correction and punishment is completely different than the narrative of what you might find for your typical, you know, American counterpart um, that that we would see as a peer. So I know a lot of my childhood experiences and yours were similar to one another, but very different from a lot of our peers. So when you're dealing with spankings and whoopings and people don't even know what you're talking about, but I understood that it came from a place of I love you, so I'm going to correct you. And also when you dig a little bit deeper into America's history and you look at slavery and you look at the police system, there was a very clear understanding when I grew up that if we aren't doing this because we love you, then the police will do it. And there are too many examples of seeing how that wound up playing out. And there was a fear. And I think that the fear that was instilled of the system correcting you, it wound up being, let us correct you. So we must be firm with you. We must be stern with you. You know, we're not going to be super emotional because that's not effective for us. That doesn't work for us. And that was instilled so deeply, you know, and so rooted in my family structure and a lot of families, you know, that that we related to. This was a, a commonality that was shared. Um, and and it is it is a huge fear. I think it's something that's had long lasting 
uh, effects, you know, and something that even in my own parenting styles, as much as there's love and there's affection and there's a lot of talking and there's a lot, you know, of working through things. For me, there's a real understanding that raising two black children in the America we live in today um, still has a lot of the the flavors and the feelings of America of long ago and the fact that it could happen and the could happen portion could have devastating consequences. So it, it does make it really hard to find a line of a really healthy balance when you're parenting. Um, and I understand my parents a lot more. I understand why things were so uh, assertive and firm, you know, and why there, there wasn't always a place for this very loving, you know, affectionate, much softer environment. I think that the, the huge fear response of consequences is something that really ruled over that in a huge way living here. That's a really great point that you're making, because just like your family, my family came here as immigrants. And when they came over here, you're right. I think their main goal was, we want to raise you to be to not put yourselves in those positions to get in trouble with the law because one second and you could just not be here. So we're gonna do everything that we can to prevent you from getting into those situations. And it's not really, they don't really do this by teaching you. They just do this by correcting you, like you said. And I think that we've been learning over the years that these things can lead to certain types of mental distress and mental health issues with these uh, boys or girls, you know, when they get to be adults, when they have this like fear response and they have all these emotions that are really pent up inside of them and never got comfortable with expressing themselves. They never got comfortable with talking about it because you see on like Family Matters and those certain types of TV shows where everyone just sits around on the couch and it's like, tell me about your day, Eddie. And it's like, well, you know, there was a bully in school and he was trying to confront me and then this and that happened and then they hug at the end of it and it looks nice. But for a lot of people, a lot of black families, <laughs> that is not the case. And I That's feel so like, when you don't teach them and allow them free expression in that kind of a way, it comes out anyways in some kind of another way. If all you saw and heard was the anger, that's what you're gonna take to your family when you have one. And sometimes people don't even realize right away where this came from, because they look at that and they're like, you know what? My dad always did this. My grandfather always did this. And my uncle always did this. I want to be nothing like that. But unless you actively engage in a process of I'm going to make changes, conscious changes to be different, you're prone to do that. Would you say that you agree with that statement? I absolutely do. And it's taken, um, actually, it was my marriage. You know, my wife taught me that lesson. Now, where I am now looking back, that you have to really think about what led to people being who they are. You, you have to think back to understand why people make the series of decisions that become their lifestyle, their speech patterns, you know, and just the, the way they go about their day and their routines. Um, and I think that for me now, I have such great empathy. I had to look back and it's frustrating. People's choices can be frustrating, but you have to have a lot of empathy for their journey and to know that things don't happen accidentally. They aren't that way, you know, by happenstance. There's a series of things that they also lived in their life that brought them to, to being who they are and making the choices that they have. So does that help you in situations where somebody has done you wrong to understand? It's profoundly. Yeah. Can you explain how? Yeah. Profoundly. It's one of those things for me where in the moment, the frustration or the anger is very real. Um, it's something that you, you're going to feel the sensations that come with those emotions. You know, your chest might get tight. Your 
fist might clench. You know, you might start sweating. You feel your heart racing. If you feel everything stirring and boiling up inside, those are very real emotions, feelings, and sensations in that moment. Um, and so it, it's through practice, honestly, to be able to take a breath and know that you need to step back and, and be able to understand, you know, analyze and process that person. If it's somebody that you know, or somebody you've had experiences with to try and think about like, what are they going through that would make them respond this way? You know, what have they gone through in their past that makes them the kind of person that would behave in this way? Cause the behavior is not in alignment with the situation or circumstances or conversation. So when things don't add up, things don't align and you get dramatic responses that are outside of the norm, it has to make you really think about why. And I think for me, that that's kind of where I go. And that's, that's where I've learned to grow my empathy muscle, you know, in a huge way is to stop and understand that sometimes in the moment you could get frustrated yourself. uh, You could boil over yourself, but definitely uh, when, when I think back and and you're introspective about it, you, you have to take those things into consideration. Yeah. So this is the in-between work that you're talking about. So is this something Correct. that you is this something that you practice actively doing in the middle of the moment in the heat of the moment are you able to take a step back in your mind and think about those same things that you're talking about and de-escalate yourself in a sense from getting to a boiling point I I look at it kind of like um the situation might be a fire that is underneath you, that's the pot of water. And at some point that fire will bring the water to its boiling point. But every moment that you take a step back and try and consider where that person's coming from, you know, or you're trying to deescalate, it's like adding an ice cube into the pot. You know, at some point the fire might be hotter than the rate at which you're adding ice cubes. So something might reach its capacity and hit its critical mass where you will boil over. Everybody has limits, you know, what they're able to take. But I think that in practicing putting really good habits uh, in, into your routines where you understand how to deescalate, you understand your triggers, you understand, you know, what is too far for you or situations that you have no business being in conversations that are triggering for you, things you have no business partaking in. You had to practice making these things routine. You had to practice, you know, pausing, even in this conversation, pausing, letting somebody else talk and and speak on something and being an active listener, you know, so I can understand fully what you're saying, process it as you're speaking to be able to give you a response and not be so self-consumed with me just giving an answer that I can't hear you anymore, you know, and a lot of, uh, I think tension within a conversation or an argument with somebody is because we don't listen. We just want to say what we have to say, you know, and learning to be an active listener could be such an important tool in and of itself. You're so right about that. Communication is usually a big underlying cause of a lot of misunderstandings. And when I say that, I mean, a lot of times people are arguing over the communication and what they heard versus the actual topic that they think they're fighting over. And this is something that I saw firsthand in a group dynamic when I used to lead these counseling groups where I would throw a topic out there to the group. This one person would say something. This person would respond to what that person said. And I'm hearing them from a neutral ear. And a lot of times they're actually both saying something really similar, but they heard it a certain way and then they got mad. They responded in a way that was insulting or condescending or rude. And the person is not even hearing what they said. They're just hearing how they said it. And then it goes, uh, this person, it starts cooking over here. It gets hotter over here. And then we have these two boiling points. But if you break down the actual issue, a lot of the times, it wasn't even worth fighting over. And it wasn't even something that you guys were that far off on. It, it, fa- it puts all those factors in there, the way you say it, the things that you hear and listening to respond ra- rather than listening for understanding. I, I absolutely agree 
with that, I think that another very important skill with communication is understanding people's body language, understanding tone and delivery, and the fact that those things do actually matter. If if you were to ask me, uh, Omar, how are you doing? And I was like, great. Or you're like, Omar, how are you doing? Great. Two wildly different responses. If if I if you ask me and I'm smiling in one, and then I'm scowling in another, your perception of how I'm doing will shift and change and be modified instantly based on what you're seeing and what you're hearing, and then the way in which that makes you feel. So it's important, you know, as we learn to communicate with one another, we understand that delivery does matter. How you say things absolutely matters. The tone that you're using, the volume that you're using, the body language that you're using. These are very underestimated uh, skills that we that we had to develop, I think, are immensely underdeveloped with a lot of people that find themselves in these contentious situations where they're extremely frustrated with somebody and, and they can't seem to turn a conversation around. They can't seem to convey what they are actually trying to say because their their delivery it could really be an issue despite how they actually feel about what they're saying or what they're trying to convey.